very much. Let me just start by saying that we are really very lucky to have um, Cecilia and Raffaele working with us. They, they actually come to the clinic, despite all the amount of work they do in the lab, they come to the clinic every week. The way this works is they, they walk out of the lab, they have a carotid clamp, so they come to our sort of intellectual level, and then they come to see the patients. And it's, it works very nice. So um, we, sh we are now moving to, to the very clinical issues. And uh, I would like to, to, to share some thoughts with you about the, the very long term of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. This is a disease uh, which often arises in, in young adolescents, young adults. And people, patients live with the disease with many, many years. Sometimes they are diagnosed when they're old and we don't really know when the disease started, but we, we do already have some 30, 40 years follow-up on the very early patients seen by cardiologists around the world, including Franco here in Florence, who started in the mid-70s following patients, and we see, still see some of the patients he originally diagnosed. And we know that it, uh, abitrophic cardiomyopathy, fortunately, is not, as a rule, a progressive disease like many other cardiomyopathies. So, this is why we are used to describing this disease at any age as a hypercontractile, hypertrophic ventricle with, you can see the force with which the, the ventricle contracts. And this, is, this can be seen at any age. So it, it is not just in the young. It, there, there is not a, a decline in function in most patients, at least clinically. Obviously, if you, it may be in the lab, not, not clinically relevant. This is why you have obstruction, by the way. Obstruction requires, dynamic obstruction requires a very, very strong ventricle, very fit, very healthy ventricle. Sorry. This is one example. This is a lady who was seen by, by Franco in 1987. She was absolutely asymptomatic because she was diagnosed with obvious asymmetric LVH. This was a non-obstructive non form, so she went then uh, disappeared, like many young people do. She didn't require any medical treatment, didn't want to be bothered, she had to go on with her life. Disappeared for many years, and after 20 years she came back. At 53 she was still perfectly okay, she came back just for routine check. And she still had a, she was perfectly asymptomatic, had a normal exercise test, and a low BNP value after 20 years of this disease, despite fibrosis, microvascular dysfunction, everything we've heard in the last two days. However, it is undeniable that, and we've heard this over the, over the many lectures, that the disease can be progressive. So there is, a, unfortunately, a subset that does progress to systolic dysfunction, end-stage, refractory heart failure, and even a tiny subset that needs to be transplanted. And this, can, this as Elena Biagini said yesterday, is age-independent. So it is not an age-related disease. Uh, age-related condition. And this is what the end stage looks like. Elena showed some beautiful cases. This is probably the most common variant. This is a lady who started with uh, familiar disease, classical phenotype, obstruction, and then was followed for many, many years, as you see, 21 years, and then she developed a hypokinetic restrictive phenotype. Uh, you can still see the hypertrophy. She refused an ICD because of um, recent loss of a son due to sudden death, and that was, that was before you know, in the early ICD area, so she just didn't want to, didn't care to get a lot of treatment this, at this stage, and she died sadly, unfortunately. So, and we know that if you have end-stage disease, you know that the underpinning of end-stage disease, as we have seen repeatedly over the last two days, is you, you must have profound remodeling of the LV with profound, uh, with extensive fibrosis, um, you not necessarily, don't necessarily have dilatation of the LV. This is actually not common to have huge dilatation in, my, in our experience. So it's generally a mild and a generally a relative dilatation, so compared to what it was, but not in absolute terms. And obviously, that diastolic dysfunction is always severe. And we know that fibrosis is really massive at this stage, and um, this is probably one of the most interesting targets for, for treatment, as we have seen. However, if we hypothesize, if we, if we know that there is a, a large subset of patients that are going well, stable over the years, they reach a normal lifespan, they have a normal life expectancy, and then we have this subset of possibly 5% of patients who are not doing well, who are going really downhill at any age. 
then because nature does not jump, and we know this from the philosophers, there must be an intermediate stage at which patients are beginning to show all the bad things that may let you hypothesize that this is a patient that is taking the wrong pathway but is not there yet. And this gray area can, uh, patients can stay in the, in the gray area for many years sometimes, and that is exactly when we can probably think about uh, treating the patients for, in order to prevent disease progression. Whether we have the tools to do this, uh, this is a hard question to answer, but it, it is still important to think about identifying the early stages that may lead to end stage. So we have seen this uh, a few times. This is a, a sort of a, a pattern in which four stages can be identified. And this can be useful for a number of reasons, including research, uh, planning trials, but also in the clinic. They, they, they're useful in order to ask the right questions on the single patient. So we've heard Caroline Ho talk about pre-hypertrophic or non-hypertrophic phenotype at length. I will not go back into this. We heard Barry talk about this as well. Then we sort of, everybody has a clear idea what the classic phenotype is, because this is what we read in textbooks. Then we know pretty well what, what the overt dysfunction, I didn't like the term end stage, because end stage sounds like there's nothing you can do for the patient, end of the road. This is not true. You can manage end stage patients for many years sometimes. It's, sometimes it's a gentle decline. Sometimes they can really, especially if they're not young, you can really, um, manage them very satisfactorily for a number of years with standard heart failure treatment. So I would rather like to call this stage overt dysfunction rather than end stage, but that's my personal view. There must be an intermediate um, stage which, I, which we called adverse remodeling. You know, it's just a name. So, but just to, um, that is the stage at which all the red flags are present or some of the red flags are present and the clinicians should start thinking about that patient in a different manner, particularly if the patient has been followed over the years and, this is, and there are signs of progression of disease. So what are the red flags? What are the things that can help you uh, understand whether the patient is stable or is not stable? Remember, what I say to patients is that HCM is a, it's like a chess match that you play over the decades. So it's not a, a matter of years, it's a matter of decades. So the changes you will see are not are never sudden, or if they are sudden, it's a bad, bad sign. But often they're subtle and occur over many, many years. So one thing that is very important to, uh, to look at is left atrial dilatation. Uh, in patients with classic hypertrophic HCM, it's uh, so the classic phenotype, stable course, this is generally due to um, obstruction, dynamic obstruction. It is very rare to, to observe severe left atrial dilatation or bi atrial dilatation in the absence of, of obstruction unless you are going in the wrong direction. So that's one thing we have to take care of. And even in patients with stable uh, course but obstruction, left atrial dilatation is a very important marker for timing of surgery because if it does dilate over time and brings over, it leads to atrial fibrillation, that is also a sign that the disease is not going well. Fortunately, however, in obstructive patients in the early phases of disease, uh, heart failure is, is fully uh, reversible with myectomy, as we know, whereas heart failure due to disease progression is not. Then, of course, we know that we have seen over these two days that if you have severe microvascular dysfunction, this is predictive of adverse outcome many, many years before you actually see the changes in the contractile function or even the, uh, the extensive fibrosis that you see in the, in the late stage. Again, fibrosis, as you can now detect by MRI, is obviously important if you see increasing or extensive fibrosis occurring, not the small quantities, not the junctional patterns, not the diffuse patterns, but the, the big scar-like patterns occurring usually at the site of maximal hypertrophy. The loss of obstruction has been described by Barry Maron many years ago. It's definitely a sign that the ventricle is losing stamina, even though ejection fraction may be within normal limits. We'll come back to this. And then, obviously, when you have the real severe patterns of, of diastolic dysfunction. The group of Trieste, I see my friend Gian, uh, Gianfranco Sinagra here, so they showed that this is highly predictive of adverse outcome if you are developing not the old abnormal relaxation but the real pseudonormal moving to restrictive pattern of, um, of LV filling. Uh, 
as well as now we can use biomarkers and we can use VO2 max. Uh, we can use cardiopulmonary exercise tests to, to find out whether these patients are really asymptomatic, are really stable, are really performing well over the years. And what is interesting is that most of these features, if not all, have been associated with outcome in cohorts, but taken separately. So as though each was a different part uh, of a different cohort of patients. Well, they, they are not. Most of these features tend to cluster. You don't find patients with severe microvascular dysfunction who don't have uh, diastolic abnormalities or don't have fibrosis. So all these features tend to be very clustered in the same subset of patients. And if one may not have one feature but have most of the others. So this is like a sort of a score that you can, uh, you know, in mentally sort of add up these factors and the, most, the more you find, the more you can think of a patient that is heading in the wrong direction. And this is just an example. We have looked with, with Marty Meron and Barry. We looked at a vast cohort of patients with, who had done an MRI and simply compared the levels of ejection fraction me measured at, at MRI, which is much more accurate than echo because it's a real tomographic ejection fraction, with a degree of fibrosis in the ventricle. And what you see here is that if you have, a, sorry, this is not in line, but uh, at the right-hand side here, you have the groups with normal or supernormal ejection fraction. And on your left-hand side, you have patients with end stage and the pre-end stage, so-called so -called, pre-end stage phase. And you see how patients who are in the real normal range for HCM, and remember, average ejection fraction for HCM was 72%, so not the 55%. Uh, if you are over 65%, you are of ejection fraction, you are likely to have, you are less likely to have uh, fibrosis, and if you have it, you have it in very small amounts. You see this at the bottom? So very small amounts of fibrosis, if your ejection fraction is preserved, there's a clear inverse relationship between fibrosis and ejection fraction. If you are in the end stage, no big surprise, 100% have fibrosis, and the amount of fibrosis is impressive. However, if you are in the 50 to 65% range of ejection fraction, then you are very much more likely to have fibrosis compared to the other uh, healthy subsets, let's call it this way, and the amount is steeply rising. So there's clearly a jump from here to here, filling the gap between patients who are super normally contracting, or at least normally contracting, and those in end stage. And these are, this is, for example, a range of ejection fraction that should really make you think. If you have a patient with, a, with HCM, and 55% ejection fraction, that is not a normal ejection fraction for somebody who should have 72. And even if, or if somebody had 75 the year before and now comes and has 65, uh, you know, can, you can blame it on beta blockers, but you have to think about progression of disease. This is one example of the adverse remodeling stage. So this is a, a young girl severely symptomatic. This is due to the fact that she had a severe mid-apical hypertrophy. Her LV cavity was very small, so restrictive pathophysiology. You can see that diastole is severely abnormal. Her ejection fraction is absolutely fantastic. I mean, she has obliteration of the apex during systole. Ejection fraction is like 80. So there's no systolic dysfunction here. Um, she has quite substantial uh, presence of fibrosis throughout these are different slices of the left ventricle. You see the septum is very heavily remodeled. And this is a, somebody who, I mean, she is already symptomatic. She has restrictive physiology. She will not probably do well over the years. So you cannot consider this to be a stable disease or classic phenotype. This is somebody who is heading towards severe heart failure, progressive heart failure. This is another example. So this is a 60-year-old um, gentleman looks very healthy and active, denies symptoms, although I suspect that he will be symptomatic if compared to, um, if put on a, on a bike ergometer, he, he didn't want to do the test. But you see here that there's biatrial dilatation, which is important, impressive. You see the smoke effect here, uh, which is associated with severe restrictive pattern of, of filling of the LV, LV. However, if you measure the ejection fraction, you, you also see that the septum is probably hypokinetic compared to the free wall. However, if you look at the ejection fraction, nobody would think this is progressive disease. And this would, you know, just, he would be put on beta blockers and sent home. Well, this is a patient who has gone through extensive remodeling of the left ventricle. 
the left atrium has dilated substantially over the, the previous five years, and the diastolic pattern has in, the, dramatically worsened over the uh, few years. But if you see him cross-sectionally, comes over the first time with this pattern, most cardiologists would probably think, okay, you know, this is HCM, hypercontractile, fine. Well, no, th this is a patient in which you really have to, um, to be very alert and, and follow him and don't trust him when, if he says he's asymptomatic, follow him closely over the years and possibly think about anterior modeling angiotensin II ACE inhibitors. We don't have evidence for that, that this may help, but um, it, is, it does help in many other conditions that are similar. So uh, I would think this is a patient you should think about switching from classical HCM treatment to the standard heart failure treatment. This is another example, and we, we went to, uh, Jill Tardif, I think, loves these uh, uh, clips because they are from a troponin T, um, young patients with troponin T mutation. We uh, have discussed these clips together. And you see here how subtle sometimes the deterioration of the disease is. It's not dramatic. This is a lady uh, who had this sort of pattern in 2006. She was around 30 years of age at the time. And then this is what she became very gradually after uh, five years. It's subtle, but I think everybody can see that, that this is not great and this is even worse. And this is severe dysfunction for HCM. This is not mild dysfunction. This is a profound um, impairment of systolic function and goes with extensive fibrosis on the MRI. She's relatively, I mean, she's a class two. She's got mild symptoms, but this is to me uh, end stage or very close to end stage disease. I have uh, offered this lady an ICD because I was really concerned and she is, you know, she's just, just implanted one. Fortunately, no events. So in this review, which we recently completed with Franco, Corrado, and, and Magdi, we tried to put all this concept together. This is by no means uh, the tables of the law. There are many things that can be improved. So it's just a proposal to, to try and, and lay down a number of parameters that you can look at in patients that come to your clinic just to understand whether uh, this is a patient that is okay, see you next year, you know, uh, stay on a beta blocker, maybe you know, take care of many issues, including obstruction, I'll come back to that. However, this is not a patient with progressive disease. Or else, whether you are uh, having, with in front of you, you have a patient with not very evident easily neglected early stages of disease progression. And the, we use the, the ejection fraction cutoff of uh, less than 50% to define overt dysfunction, 50 to 65% to define averse remodeling, and everything above 65% to define a classic phenotype. This is, again, very arbitrary. I, I understand and I fully uh, acknowledge this. It, it, it is based on the, on the paper I showed you before, and uh, we had to put some, some easy cut point. This was also requested by the reviewers because you know, if you, if you want to give, like any classification, you have to make it easy, although um, this will make it imprecise. So um, I hope this can be improved over, over time. But, uh, and uh, along these, these four groups, I have tried to, we have tried to outline what the collateral findings may be. And again, not all, the, all of these features will be present in each group. Uh, there will be overlap, huge overlap. But again, this is just a, just a proposal. So what is interesting here is that there are cutoffs of, of LGE that will match pretty closely the ejection fraction values in a sort of a reverse order, because we know this is a consistent in the literature. There is a, an inverse relationship between ejection fraction and amount of LGE. So this is a pretty safe assumption that if you have somebody with a low ejection fraction, the lower the ejection fraction, the higher the, the fibrosis, with exceptions, obviously, but it's a, a consistent rule. And again, LV feeling pattern, symptoms, supposedly, and coronary microvascular dysfunction are reasonably correlated to, to the degree of, of systolic dysfunction. Um, the presence of ob obstruction is inversely related as well, because of what we were saying. It is very unlikely to find obstruction in, the progression, in, in disease progression. People lose their obstruction. Whereas, in, so you, can, you really have to have a very healthy ventricle to, to produce obstruction. And, 
Uh, in fact, when we looked at those, um, at those MRIs, patients with long-standing obstruction, we were, th we were hypothesizing huge chunks of fibrosis because of subendocardial stress, whatever. And well, no, patients with fibrosis with obstruction had very, very little. Zero to three percent of the ventricle was fibrous. So uh, you will not find obstruction in patients who are progressing. Obviously, if you leave somebody in, with severe obstruction over time, this is not good, and they may end up not very well. But if you relieve obstruction, we know that the ventricle um, can function very, very well over time, and you would normalize life expectancy, in fact. Uh, other features, atrial remodeling, we talked about atrial fibrillation, um, which it becomes increasingly frequent. And the prevalence of complex phenotypes, again, can be hypothesized to increase over time. It is much more prevalent in the end-stage subgroup as compared to classic phenotypes. So in the, in the, um, in the stage three, you would probably find an intermediate frequency. This has to be shown, however. And obviously, outcome. Uh, this is important because, obviously, we need data here. We don't have data, but we know end-stage disease is, has a very high uh, mortality due to both heart failure and sudden death. Um, stable, non-obstructive disease is uh, a, a relatively favorable condition because of low event risk. Uh, the exception, of course, in, in, class, in stage number two is patients with obstruction, which need to be treated. And so in the, in the stage three, so in the adversary modeling phase, you are probably going to get an intermediate outcome. This is not based on assumption only. It's based because these patients are the patients with atrial fibrillation, with microvascular dysfunction. And we know that these patients, based on previous studies, have an outcome which is not as good as the patients without these features. So it's, it's a reasonable extrapolation. So why is this important? Is it, uh, as I said, it, I think it is important in, in terms of clinical management, but it is also important in terms of the research questions that you want to ask. Because at each stage, you have to ask different questions when you want to do some prospective, well-organized, methodologically sound research in these patients. So we heard Caroline uh, beautifully talk about non-hypertrophic stage. If you have um, patients who are genotype, individuals who are genotype positive and no hypertrophy, uh, you have to, to see whether you're missing something on the early phenotype. Barry talked about this about, with the MRI and look for manifestations other than uh, left ventricular hypertrophy. I'll show you an example. But if you want to do research on this, these individuals, obviously the question to ask is, can I prevent development of disease? Which is very hard, and we heard about that. This is just one example, briefly. This is a young, a young, a young guy from, a young a child uh, from a family with protein C disease. No hypertrophy, although there's a, there's a full stand on here mimicking hypertrophy. Uh, Cribs, uh, slightly reduced um, TDI, so mild subclinical impairment of, uh, of diastole, abnormal uh, mitral apparatus. This can happen irrespective of, of hypertrophy. And we see this is an independent feature. And there's this Q wave here in the ECG, which is very suspicious for transmission of disease. He was obviously proven to, be, uh, to have received the, the mutation from the father who's affected. If you're in stage two, so a patient with classic phenotype, hypercontractile LV, uh, you have to aim for quality of life, control of symptoms. You have to stratify for a risk of sudden death. That's very important. And also, you have to deal with obstruction, because that's where obstruction is important in stage one. These are often obstructive. If they're not obstructive at rest, they will be on exercise. And dealing with obstruction uh, in, a, in the best possible way is the, the best guarantee for their long-term survival and quality of life. If you want to, to do research with these subsets, with these patients, you cannot ask the big questions, because these are patients who have very, very small event rates. So if you want to do an outcome studies uh, with new drug, and you're hoping and you find a big network of people, and you have the sponsor for this, which we hope to have in, a, in the future, you can't enroll these patients if you want to answer this question, because this is going to take forever. And it's going to take a 1,000 of patients. So you have to aim for surrogate endpoints. You can look at symptoms. Functional capacity, perfusion, arrhythmias on the halter, all the surrogate endpoints. They're not as exciting, but don't aim for outcome studies in this subset. And unfortunately, this is, or fortunately, because they are, this is the largest subset by far. Uh, 
If you have patients in whom you are suspecting or you can see remodeling and progression of disease, you have to aim for control of symptoms, AF management becomes an issue here very, very often, whereas obstruction becomes much less of an issue here. You have to prevent progression as well as you can, and, and again, risk 25 for a sudden cardiac death. The studies on gadolinium have shown us that the risk of sudden death does increase with the degree of remodeling of the heart. And this is the subgroup to, in which you can really do the studies looking at outcome. These are patients who have a, a high or reasonably high or moderately high risk of events, and they are symptomatic. They um, will have events over, uh, over time. So this is probably the, your best bet if you really want to, to answer some of the big questions we still need, need to answer for HCM. And if you have patients with overt dysfunction, we know their prognosis is, is very bad. We know we need to do everything we can to treat a heart failure like in any other cause of heart failure. It may be a little more difficult here. Uh, and you have to consider all the options you would consider in, in any patient with, with advanced heart failure. And obviously, the only outcome that, that matters here is improvement of, of longevity and adding life uh, to their expectancy. <laughs> and ultimately, um, I think if we learn to, to, to see this, this is a very heterogeneous disease. We've said it so many times. So it is a, a spectrum of conditions under the same umbrella. We need to really try to find what Magdi calls disease and patient-specific the answers to the patient. And the only way to do this is to really look at subset, because this is such a different, such a heterogeneous disease. You cannot think of addressing all the questions in each patient. This is just not feasible. And I would like to, again, end by thanking all the people that have helped us over the years. Um, and thank you all. First, um, when we are trying to identify this um, early phase of remodeling, um, what do you think about um, uh, 2D strain? Because in, in my daily practice, I think that uh, 2D strain is um, quite interesting to identify uh, the evolution of uh, uh, this uh, um, global dysfunction, even though ejection fraction is still absolutely normal. Uh, to this strain is already decreased, and especially the heterogeneous um, uh, analysis between the septum, the basal septum, especially, and the over. So, it, perhaps it could be another red flag to add to uh, the, the, the deciphering of this uh, remodeling stage. And the question two is when, still related to this phase, remodeling phase. When you identify several um, indicators for this phase, what do you recommend in practice for the management of this stage? This is a topic for research, of yes. course, but in your daily practice, what, what do you recommend? Thank you, Philippe. Uh, that's a great question. So TDI and, and uh, strain. I don't have personal experience on that. We do very basic echocardiography because of time constraints when we see the paper. A lot of patients, but we are obviously interested. I think uh, there are experiences showing that this is important. It would be interesting to find out how independent this is from the other factors. So, what the, the incremental value is compared to, for example, to gadolinium. I think it, it may have well have some independent factor, but um, exactly, I think exactly we need more data on that. Just to add on this, um, TDI studies are become very important when you really have overt dysfunction because these patients need an ICD if you are in the real end stage phase. And again, there are, there is, there's very little evidence to, but, but encouraging evidence, evidence showing that uh, CRT, so cardiac risk synchronization, biventricular um, uh, pacing may be helpful in this patient. We have had some dramatic responders. However, you, if you use the classic uh, parameters used for dialectical homopathy, you would, you know, you never, you don't, they will, this will never work. So you need to find parameters. This is where, where TDI echo, I think, is useful. We do look for asynchrony. And if there is significant asynchrony with TDI, we tend to, to implant if there is overt systolic dysfunction, of course. And we've had some responses. The second uh, question is very difficult. So what do we do in clinical practice? Uh, basically, what I, what I said before. So if you have a patient who has 55 percent ejection fraction, extensive remodeling at MRI. The left atrium is 100 cc's, no obstruction, 
Um, this is the time when I switched to from the heavy doses of beta blockers to ACE inhibitors, uh, carvedilol, um, spironolactone, and you know, and, and check over time the BNPs and, and VO2. Um, yes, uh, Count uh, Jacopo, uh, thank you for your overview. Um, thank you. I think was on. And uh, um, you have mentioned repeatedly LG, MRI, and LG. And uh, these last two days, a lot has been said about uh, the LG, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, in our experience, after hundreds of uh, MRIs, we don't expect, we don't accept uh, to see a patient uh, unless an MRI is, and an MRI has been done in that patient because we want to see the amount of LG. From your presentation, I perceive that you feel that LG represents a reliable indicator of the progression of the disease, meaning the um, proportion of cardiac cells, that lo of loss of cardiac cells. Is that uh, the correct interpretation of your, of your thought and your thinking? So, uh, so the question is whether, whether as you LG reflect... LG equal progression of the disease, equal loss of myocytes. Okay, yeah. Uh, again, so if you have, uh, unless it is junctional, if it's, if it's a scar-like, LGE occurring in the okay. site of maximal hypertrophy, okay. that is usually a, some, you know, believed to be loss of tissue uh, and um, replacement fibrosis. This is due to several, I mean, starting with the, with the observation from the Padua group in, in the pathology uh, samples, in which they, they describe very, very well ischemia at several stages plus replacement fibrosis as well as interstitial fibrosis. So they distinguish two kinds of fibrosis, including replacement fibrosis, with ischemia at several stages. So we do know that there is a correlation between microvascular dysfunction, um, fibrosis, which is presumably replacement, and decline in, in systolic function. Not all fibrosis is due to loss of tissue. So there will be activation of the matrix, which is independent, and which may be just a more or less innocent bystander. Uh, the distinguish between the two is, is sometimes hard, so I think, yeah, that is also a, a very intriguing point. I don't know whether this is the... Uh, you were asking for something more specific, uh, maybe. Yeah, okay, but... Uh, okay. Thank you. Uh, any question from the audience? One question here. Some of these patients with Hocum have... Uh, on autopsy microinfarcts, and my question relates to two potential therapies, one of which is, is there any role for aspirin to prevent microthrombi? That may be part of the pathophysiology. And there's, and aldosterone's a big player in, in promoting fibrosis in certain types of myocardial diseases. Any role for aldosterone antagonism in these patients? Thank you. Two very good questions. Um, aspirin. There is no data. My, my personal feeling is that because ischemia here is not due to any, anything to do with the platelets, although, I mean, there may be times, but generally speaking, this is ischemia due to, as Paolo Kimishi showed yesterday, uh, severe microvascular functional uh, abnormalities, so that there is a mismatch between demand and supply during exercise and during when the threshold gets, gets higher. So I am not sure that aspirin would, would uh, make a lot of a difference. Um, but again, uh, it's, this is my personal feeling. Uh, aldosterone is a, is a very important thing. It, it, we know aldosterone is elevated in HCM, in the tissue, and there, has, there is a trial, ongoing trial, which Marty Meron is carrying out uh, on spironolactin in these patients, looking at fibrosis, because obviously any other outcome, uh, 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 endpoint would be. Uh, so we, I don't know what the results are yet. I don't think it is over yet. Our last question, please. Yes, Dr. Arad, right. I keep turning off. Thank you, Kobo, for an excellent overview.
I have I have seen this heart with huge atria and you know this slow flow with air bubbles or smoke. And uh, I wonder what is the stage when you will start warfarin in such a patient? Will it be after the first run of atrial fibrillation or after the first stroke or maybe beforehand? <laughs> That's an excellent question. Um, again, this is, this is uh, w where you go into you know, personal opinions. So I would say, I would keep the threshold very low, and I would I would look for atrial fibrillation, a subclinical atrial fibrillation, and then so have a very low threshold in patients like this because obviously risk is very high. Um, I don't know that you can start the, the warfarin without any evidence of of uh, atrial arrhythmias, although I'd be tempted to. But this is somebody who will go into atrial fibrillation very soon. Uh, th the other thing is whether to go to give aspirin. To, I've been asked this, and this is, may be reasonable, but again, it's very speculative. Too. Should we give aspirin to people with a big atria and diastolic dysfunction who have not yet developed um, atrial fibrillation? Uh, it, it makes me nervous not give anything to this guy, but you know, um, we don't have data. <laughs>